Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Cassandra Tennyson and I'm one of the co-founders of Women in Business New York, also the owner of Sublime Moments Events, and I am so excited that you all were able to make it. Hello, my name is Corin Bell Fung and I am a co-founder of Women in Business New York, as well as the founder of JMSW Printing. We have our panel here today, but we first of all we wanted to at least take a moment out and be thankful and joyful that we're here as women in business and knowing that a higher and greater being is in the room guiding us every day in our businesses and in our daily lives. I'd like to also bring up Jocelyn Rainey from the Brooklyn Navy Yard. She has a few words to share with us. So first I want to say thank you for being here. Um, the Brooklyn Navy Yard is an amazing space. It's an amazing place to be, and I'm so glad you're here. If it's your first time being here, I hope it's not your last. Um, we're particularly excited because some of the people that work here and really help with our thriving economic um, development organization are here as well. So we're glad that Khaki is here and they're part of this. Um, I am the Chief Administrative Officer, and I'm also the MWBE Officer. So the Navy Yard is very, very much committed to using minority and women-owned businesses in our day-to-day -day contracting. We are a 300-acre industrial park. We have over 300 businesses here that do business every day. 7,000 people come here to work. Um, we are going through our largest, largest growth. In the next five years, there will be over 20,000 people coming here. So the opportunities here are amazing. And our CEO, who couldn't be here today, and he really wanted to be here, and I'm here to bring you greetings for him, is really, really committed to doing what's right for the community. So we are really excited to be working with this group. Um, we hope that we'll be doing more. Um, and I'm excited that you have this wonderful panel here. So thank you for being here with us. <laughs> so we wanted to start with our moderator, Melanie Farrow. Good evening, my name is Melanie Farah. I am the chair of the New York City chapter of Dawn, which is the Diaspora African Women African Women's Network. I am an education activist who currently works in the early childhood education, <coughs> and I am the former host of a Brooklyn Independent Television Show. And I'm excited to be here with the lovely ladies and the powerful women that we have on this panel. And I would love if you all could take a few moments to introduce yourselves and briefly tell us a little bit about you, how you became an entrepreneur. Good evening, everyone. My name is Shalay Sims. I'm a professor of management at SUNY Westbury, as well as the assistant vice president for academic affairs. I also do community enterprise um, consulting uh, in my other time. Now, before she, before we move on, that is Doctor Shalay Sims. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 doctor. I, I want to give you an <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Arkel Cox. I am uh, a Brooklyn native. I'm, I'm born and raised here in Brooklyn. I have two daughters. Um, they're not here with me tonight. They're, they're tired of hearing mommy speak, but um, <laughs> I speak a lot. But uh, um, I'm a business owner here in Brooklyn. I own a couple of uh, restaurants, small little restaurants. Some of you might have heard of them by the name of IHOP International or Eaton at them, Doctor, yes. And so, um, that's just you know one of the things that I do. As women, we are very multifaceted. We do many things. So um, I'm not going to go into too much, but that's my claim to fame: being a developer and franchise operator here in Brooklyn. Hi, my name is Nicole Panseca. I'm also a restaurateur, and uh, a little bit of information on myself: I was in advertising, was at Saatchi and Saatchi when I realized that Filipino food had zero um, presence. And I decided if no one was going to do it, then I would. So I moonlighted for 12 years. I was an ad exec by day and worked my way up to VP. But by night, I started being a dishwasher and a host, a waitress, a bartender, and a manager so that I could learn this industry and that I could only depend on myself if all things failed. Um, I started what is now called pop-ups. Um, before, we were a limited engagement. That's how I used to market it. But New York Magazine called it a pop-up, and now we know the term uh, temporary or startup businesses as pop-up. 
I won Best Burger, I beat Shake Shack, among others, in 2014. Um, thank you, and I have uh, two stars in the New York Times, and I've uh, had really good luck with press without having uh, formal PR. And I just wanted to say that I was so intimidated walking in here. I saw you first, and you were gorgeous, and everyone here looks amazing, but so I'm so thankful to be here. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Courtney Arrington Baldwin, and I'm the co-owner of Mr. Baldwin Style, which is actually a menswear wardrobe styling company, where my husband and I, we own it together. We focus on uh, styling for wardrobe styling for grooms and just men in general. So my background is actually completely different. I have a civil engineering degree. I spent 15 years in construction out on the job site, um, project manager, um, building buildings up to $93 million, and just in the last two and a half years, have founded this company with my husband, and then for the last year, made the full transition to being a full-time entrepreneur. Um, my name is Sherelle Starr, and I am the founder and CEO of Not Just a Girl in a Dress. It is a lifestyle blog that covers fashion, beauty, technology, and of course, entrepreneurship. And I'm really focused on helping people find their own version of success, their own path to success. That's really what the site's about. I started my journey to the land of entrepreneurship about five years ago where I started my own tech startup firm. Um, and when I was doing that, I was also blogging on the side. And what I found was people uh, were more attracted to the blog than the business itself. <laughs> uh, and so I was actually making more money off the blog than the business I was running. And so I closed that down and, and sort of rebranded the blog into not just a girl and dress, but it is now. Um, and so I've been working on that for the last four years. My background's in PR and events, and so I sort of took a non-traditional journey to entrepreneurship. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, ladies, and thank you, audience. So as we move forward and we have our conversation, I want you to understand and remember that you're a part of the dialogue. We're having a conversation with you, and as we celebrate Women's History Month, whether you're here to because you're on the precipice of greatness or you're an entrenched entrepreneur, that we're here to inspire each other and that we're here to celebrate each other's successes, no matter how big or small, because that's what keeps us, mo that put keeps us motivated. Right, Dr. Sin? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with that said, talking about inspiration and looking for things that keep us moving, um, Sherelle, why don't you talk to us a little bit about how you define success in your own terms? Sure, you know, for me, it took a long time for me to figure out what I wanted in life. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I started working in PR and events because truly I knew you could make a lot of money in it. So I went to college for public relations. I graduated, started working in public relations. Um, and it really all stemmed from me growing up, you know, in Harlem. I was in and out of foster care, really, you know, poor home. Um, and so for me, making money was top of mind. So I thought that would make me feel really successful. And as I started making money, you know, I was making more money than anyone in my family had ever made, you know, six-figure income at like 25 years old. But I wasn't feeling complete. Um, and so it took me a long time to figure out what I what success was truly to me and for me it really is being able to build a home I just recently got married um, and I'm looking forward to sort of having kids with my husband and building this home together um, and also being able to be creative in my own way and help other people that's what really excites me is, is not only seeing my business grow but when other people um, email me and say oh I'm so glad you shared that tip or I'm so glad you shared that challenge that that you know fashion designer was having because it helped me get through the day and so those are things that I find I'm really passionate. I find motivating. So that's sort of how I've been defining success for myself. Right, like exactly. Positive feedback. Exactly. Well, with that said, uh, Arkell, I would love for you to talk a little bit about how you define success. Um, did you wake up and decide that uh, you were going to go into this journey and I'm going to purchase IHOP and I know this is going to be amazing? Or let's tell. I love your story, but everyone doesn't know your story. So I would love for you to talk a little bit about how you define success on your terms. Okay. Since we're being totally honest. Yeah. <laughs> Success found me. Okay. Um, I was very comfortable with being the shadow of my husband. So this was my husband's vision, my husband's dream. And it came about with the IHOPs. My husband and I had many businesses, real estates. We had a nightclub right down the block on Washington and Flushing um, many years ago before this whole resurgence of the Navy Yard started. We had the vision that, you know what, this is a great, you know, property and we want to you know we want to figure out how can we be a part of it so we opened rain bar and lounge not too like i said steps away but 
more importantly, one night while we were there, it was a major snowstorm in New York, and my eldest daughter, I only had one child at the time, she wanted to go to IHOP. And so there was only one IHOP in Brooklyn. We're not going to say where it is, but we all know where that IHOP is. Yeah. And so we live blocks away from here. We drove across town to this one IHOP that I grew up at. And um, it, wasn't, it wasn't a pleasant experience. And so we, in this snowstorm, trucked to New Jersey to go to an IHOP. And that night, my husband said to his attorney, let's see what we can do to open an IHOP in Brooklyn. My husband was amazing with foresight. He knew what needed to be where and when. And so I personally thought he was crazy. So that's why I said success found me, because I couldn't see the vision at the time. And so, long story made short, we opened um, four years, actually waited four years to be approved by IHOP. Going back and forth to California on our own dime, spending our own monies in hotels and you know, just doing everything that they required us to do. By the grace of God, we got our first location, which was the Livingston location, four years later. And within months, we became the sole developers for Brooklyn because the store took off. We were the number one store in the country for seven years. And so, blessing, yeah. And so with that being said, they said, you guys know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> you're the developers for Brooklyn. So. Donald Trump could come to Brooklyn and open, and, you know, want to open an IHOP, but he can't because I am the sole developer. Thank you. Thank you for that. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so, Nicole, you were really thorough in your approach to what you wanted to do. I love that you were very intentional in your quest for success. But what are some of the areas you think you may have overlooked on your journey? That some some tips that you can give the ladies in our audience about things that they should consider that you may not have thought of. I overlooked the ability to delegate earlier on, um, and what happened was that I wound up spending too much time working in the business versus working on the business. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, thanks. Um, I spent too much time working in the business versus working on the business, and I'll explain that by saying. Uh, I'd spent too much time actually working on the floor or making sure the guests were being tended to versus making sure I had a manager who was making sure that was happening and I was overseeing the growth and the numbers and bigger picture idea. Um, I'm realizing that now and uh, better late than ever. So in terms of delegating, you're a project manager. You came from, she came from Turner Construction, again, women down, but let's not downplay our success. You came from big deal construction world. How were you able to make that partnership with your husband where coming from, you were the project manager of millions and millions of dollars. Yeah. Here, you all are starting together. How were you able to make that partnership work? Uh, it works pretty well. My husband is more of a creative. He's kind of in the clouds sometimes. <laughs> so, he, and I appreciate that about him. So we really keep a, a good definition, you know, or division, I should say, in our business where he really lets me handle the business side. He comes up with the creative ideas and um, sort of the dreamy things, and I'm more the realistic one. I think the, the most challenging thing is um, the different types of people that I'm working with now. So construction people, I'm used to kind of having a little bite in my tone, and sometimes I write emails and I let my husband read and he's like, mm, you gotta take the bite off of that. Like, these, yeah. are, these are people that are getting married, these are people, this is a different industry, so that's been a little bit of a challenge, because I'm used to, I'm the boss, you don't do this, you don't get on the bid list next time, you know? So it's, you know, kind of softening out, but still getting what I need without just making people upset, <laughs> you know? A doctor sounds. Can you pass the microphone? So we had a conversation earlier about thinking about what space you're in when you're making decisions. Um, what recommendations would you have for women to be in an appropriate space so that they don't overlook these things that they need, they may need to consider as they move forward as entrepreneurs? Okay. So in our conversation that I had with Melanie, part of my research is looking at how your identity affects your decision making and really how it affects your take and risk. And I think we'll all agree that entering business as an entrepreneur is somewhat of a risk. And so what I look at is how we wear different hats. So you're, you're a mother, you're a business owner, you are a relative, 
you are a former employee, all of these things play in your mind. And when one of those things is foremost in your mind, it changes how you make decisions, right? And so a lot of times as women, we think of ourselves as women entrepreneurs and we carry the burden of if I fail, I fail for women. And that creates a burden that sometimes is not necessary or sometimes that we just have to kind of work through. And so I advise that people recognize that these things are at work and that sometimes you don't have to make as fast a decision as you think you have to before mm -hmm. take the time to think, why am I making this decision? Who am I taking into consideration? Is this really working for the business? Can I make a different decision? And I think if we slow down our decision making a little bit, it makes a difference in our level of success in the future. I love that. So ladies, they've been dropping some really precious nuggets here. So we heard about uh, not being afraid to delegate, right? We heard about slowing your thinking down, but not necessarily being afraid to take risks. Being open to the, to the visionary, if you're not the visionary, but possibly partnering with that visionary. But I would love to know how has all of this, and any one of you, I'd love for you to jump in, affected your, becoming an entrepreneur, affected your family lifestyle? So I decided I didn't like my job, and so I wanted to go back to school to do research about businesses. Um, and when I started back in school, I had twin daughters, they were turning four, and I went to school in Connecticut. And I had to figure out, I don't want to leave my children, my husband doesn't know how to do hair. I have to figure all of these things out because they matter, right? If you have a one-year-old whose hair doesn't get done, she doesn't care. You have a three-year-old who thinks she's cute, they start to care. And so you, you, all of those things start to play out. And I'm three hours away from home, I have to figure out uh, who's going to pick people up. My phone bill at at and my phone bill was $700 one month because people kept calling me, mommy, what's going on, Shalay, what are you doing, blah, 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 because all of these things had to be done at the same time that I'm trying to pursue what I want to do. And without the support, which is why I commuted, because everybody else was here. I'm from Brooklyn, everybody, my parents, my husband's parents, anybody who I needed in an emergency, if somebody's sick, if somebody needs to be picked up at short notice, if somebody gets forgotten, all of those things mm -hmm. matter, and I had to figure out how do I manage my support while pursuing what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. right? And sometimes that support can lead to, I mean, if you look at the women on this panel, leads to success that sometimes is out of balance in your relationship, right? Where one is making a little more money than the other, one is getting a few more accolades than the other, and you have, I had to figure out how to make sure that my family always knew that they were first and that they were part of the process. So I took my children with me if I did research presentations. I took my husband with me. He would help me think about negotiating for jobs, help me think about once I wanted to do um, consulting, help me think about where my deficits were and how to complement my deficits so that the whole time they were always a part of the process. And so that I didn't feel like even though day to day I'm making trade-offs, in the end my family didn't have to be totally sacrificed in order for my vision to be met. Um, I pretty much found that, you know, my family, I have a great support system. What I didn't say to many of you is that I am newly widowed. Um, three and a half years ago my husband died of stage four colorectal cancer two days after his 40th birthday. How does that happen? 6'4", 240 pounds, extremely healthy, extremely handsome, you know, and um, didn't get sick. Uh, my children would be sick and I'll be like, oh, and he'll be catching throw up in his hand and never get sick. But that was God's will, right? So for me, my family was very supportive of being there and helping nurture and raise the children and be there for me in that three months that my husband was sick and taken from us. What I find is that they think that because everything was pretty much established, our real estate and the stores, that I should be comfortable in saying, I don't have to want more. I don't have to do anything else. And so for me, I have to. I feel like it's not for me because I never expected my husband to not be here and all that we built together. I was that silent, very strong force behind my husband. I was comfortable with that. What I didn't know is that 
all of that was God's preparation for me to stand now and build two stores in three years, which mm -hmm. is, you can attest to this, this is, it's just God's blessing. Like you don't build two franchise stores. Everybody in the industry thought I was crazy, but it was our will. And for me, it's the legacy of my children. And so when you say family, that's my strength. That's what I want to do. I want to leave them so that my 17-year-old, when she graduates, she graduates and she has a store. That's her legacy. So that's what I'm looking to do now. And that's what I want to tell everybody else. That's what's important. Don't buy your kids a car for graduation. So what you can buy them a car. Buy them a franchise. You know, teach them to be their own boss. Don't let them graduate with debt. Let them graduate with something that they can lure themselves into. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't want to get too far away from family, but I do want to shift a little bit. Sherelle, you said you were newly married. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about the importance of selecting a partner mm -hmm. in life of being an entrepreneur? I think it's important, and I think it often gets lost in the conversation. Um, and we're going to move for a little bit. I would love for you to share a little bit about the importance of that? Yeah, well, what I would say is, you know, my husband uh, and I met at a very interesting time in my life. I had just quit my job um, and decided I'm going to do entrepreneurship, and we met online. Um, we actually met on eHarmony, so we were an online romance. Um, <laughs> and so when he met me, I was already, uh, you know, I had already taken the, the first step, you know, and cut the strings. And so he met me at a very, very interesting time when, you know, I would have these extreme highs, you know, when something good would be going right, and these extreme lows when something bad was going wrong. And so he sort of um, helped me navigate all of that. And he's just sort of become my, my rock. Um, no one's more supportive of me than my husband, Stephen. Um, to this day, I mean, if, if something big is happening, he is my biggest cheerleader. If something bad is happening, he is the one pushing me and say, reminding me, you've gotten through worse. And so it's just so important to make sure you find someone that, you know, what I do and what Stephen do, we're on two very different sort of paths as far as career-wise goes. He's in education, he's an administrator, um, he's very successful at what he does, but it's very, very important to find someone who has a passion like you have um, and someone who wants to push you and will always make you do your best and always help you do your best. I feel I do that for him and I know he does that for me and I think that is more important than anything else, making sure that you're both bringing that to the table. I love this. Uh, Nicole? And, and just to be clear, when I talk about partner, it could be your business partner, your life partner, male or female. We are, we're thinking about people who can be compliments in our lives. So I would love for, you, for any of you to just share a little bit about Nicole. Um, well, my business partner is also my life partner. We're newly engaged. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but I, I'm at the beginning stages of learning how to balance all of this. And um, it's difficult. You go home and you want to talk about work and you want to complain or vent about someone at work who happens to be the person also lying next to you. <laughs> so that is not romantic. <laughs> but it's real. And um, I, I think the one thing I can say that in hindsight, looking, looking on our relationship is um, knowing when to fight and knowing when to take flight and knowing when to it's not worth the argument um, but we're both very strong-willed uh, he's Dominican yeah. <laughs> are you the representation here in the room? The only one? <laughs> so, <laughs> we talked earlier so she, we talked about our backgrounds but um, yeah, it, it's a, we're also balancing our different cultures, mixed cultures. Like, it's it's intense. We deal with work, we deal with love, we deal with cultures, we deal with expectations. All I can say is, some way and somehow, we're making it work day by day. So, Courtney, you must have advice. Uh, yeah, I do. I think, um, as Cheryl was saying, just having someone that is supportive and in your in your corner is so key. I mean. I think my husband, probably upon marrying me, thought that my path was engineering. This is thing, girl power. And then last year, I'm like, I got to get out of this. I want to do Mr. Baldwin style full time. And I think that was probably a shot to him. You know, I mean, it's, it's a large income out of the house. <laughs> so, you know, you need, you need that support. You need someone that understands um, the changes that you have in life. And, and realistically, you, you change as a person what becomes important 
what's important to you at one point is not what may be later on. So, you know, my priorities changed. I wanted to not be so stressed, for one. I wanted to, you know, at some point have children, and I just knew a construction lifestyle was just not going to, to give me that. And so just having a supportive partner is, is key. I mean, just being with the right person is, is a really important thing. Capital. Everybody wants to know where do you find it, how do you acquire it, what, would it, what were any of the gender equity issues that may have been barriers to getting that funding? Um, everybody looks like yes, I said, so Dr. Sim. So, I just want to talk about the getting capital is important. Thank you. Getting capital is important, but it is not as important as understanding how to use it. And we think that if we throw money at an issue, that it will solve itself. But if you do not have a clear understanding about what your business is, how it's growing, and how you intend to use that capital, then it just causes more problems and creates solutions. So I just think be very mindful of how you approach your um, seeking capital. Um, for us, we initially started out, like I believe and I tell everybody, your credit. You know, you have to have good credit. I have one of my bankers in the room. <laughs> and so, in, in all honesty, um, when we initially started, we had several businesses which helped us to fund um, the bigger entities, but uh, traditional banking was what we did initially, and having the good credit enabled us to do that. Um, but in building the other stores, we found that it was more beneficiary for us, my partner and myself, after my husband passed on, for us to use our own funding because then when you have your, some people say, you know, you don't use your own money, you use somebody else's money, but at the end of the day, when you have to pay back a hard money loan or you have to pay back a traditional institute, it's a lot more stressful than you having to say, you know what, I've used my own money, so I'm going to make sure that, you know, I'm here, I'm watching everything, I'm overseeing everything, and I'm delegating where, you know, this money's going, and so you have that power, that authority, more so, you have more of a condition, because it's your money, and so it's a difference, it's a big difference, either which way, whether you borrow it, and you know, you're still responsible, but when it comes out, of your own bank account and you see it and you have to write those checks, it becomes more of a realistic thing for us. That's what we found. So the first restaurant is called, thank you, Maharlika, and it's uh, one of the first modern Filipino restaurants. And what's exciting is that if I look on hashtags or that whole social media thing, I see people from Dubai and London very much um, uh, inspired by my dishes or concepts, so that's exciting. Um, the second restaurant is called Jeepney.